Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Brahkin. Today we continue to talk about the Russian Revolution and the uh, Civil War series of lectures, and that's in the playlist Russia under the Communist Regime. Uh, today I'd like to talk about one of the most controversial and interesting topics of the Russian Revolution, and that is the murder of the Tsar Nicholas and perhaps of his family. So, um, to put it in the right context, in the preceding videos we talked about the sliding on, into chaos of Russia in the spring of 1918 uh, with the elections of the Soviets that were disbanded with the uh, Central Executive Committees which expelled the opposition with the so-called rebellion of the left SARS which was basically a Bolshevik attempt to get rid of uh, the other party in power, the left SARS. All this is in the context of the beginning of the Civil War. Now, the Civil War is also a very complex topic because there are different kinds of conflicts going on at the same time. But as far as the Tsar is concerned, what is important is who controlled what by July 1918. So if we look at the map of the Russian Empire, it would be like this. Uh, the, the Baltic countries and Ukraine are occupied by the Germans. The south of Russia, the Cossack lands, are occupied by General Krasnov, the, the Ataman of the um, anti-Bolshevik Cossacks. Uh, and most importantly, what happened in July uh, in June, actually, is the rebellion of the Czechoslovaks, a complicated story who were prisoners of war, who rebelled against the, their masters, the Austrians, who uh, were created a Czech legion that uh, was actually uh, considered an allied force against the Germans. Uh, and then when Lenin uh, and Trotsky signed the peace treaty with the Germans, the Germans demanded to disarm the Czechs uh, as as allied force loyal to France and and, uh, and Britain uh, so the Trotsky tried to do it and and as a result they rebelled and joined forces with the SRs uh, who wanted to declare war in Germany continue the war and overthrow the Bolsheviks whom they had seen now as the um, stooges of uh, the Germans so this is the political context now briefly about the Tsar and what he was doing now, after uh, the abdication in February, uh, he stayed in St. Petersburg for a while, and then the provisional government decided to move him away from the capital, and he was uh, exiled to Tobolsk, which is a city uh, in uh, Siberia. And he lived peacefully in Tobolsk, uh, and uh, nothing particularly happened. Uh, and then in early 1918, um, while he was still in Tobolsk, uh, the uh, Bolsheviks were very weak in Siberia. The local government belonged to the uh, Mensheviks and SRs. Uh, anyway, uh, there was a person called Yakovlev who was sent by uh, Sverdlov, uh, who was the chairman of the Central Executive Committee of Soviets, uh, a close friend of Lenin and man number two, if not num after Lenin, with Trotsky. So Sverdlov, the chief executive officer, so to speak, of Russian government, he sends Yakovlev to get uh, uh, the Tsar up to Yekaterinburg and actually some documents show to Moscow. So they want to bring him back to have him closer. There's no, not yet, any talk of uh, execution or anything like this. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that Trotsky was preparing a, a trial of the Tsar and there was, there was supposed to be published and, and make a big propaganda deal out of it. Uh, and for that purpose, he was, uh, Yakovlev was instructed to take the Tsar back to Moscow. Uh, well, uh, there was all kinds of speculations what went wrong. I mean, he, his train did not go to Moscow. He was stopped in the middle, tried to go back. There's some speculation that Yakovlev may have tried to save the Tsar. Or, or that there's another speculation uh, that the Yekaterinburg um, Bolsheviks in the Ural region wanted to uh, execute the Tsar even earlier. Uh, in any case, there was some kind of confusion, in, uh, but in the end, uh, he did arrive uh, in late spring to uh, Yekaterinburg, the city in the middle of the Ural region. Uh, and then, uh, uh, separately from him, his daughters and his wife and his son came there too. So, they are in Yekaterinburg in June 
1918. Now, what is happening, of course, is very, very important because in, in, in the first week of June, there's a rebellion uh, of the SRs in Samara, which is a city on the south of Volga. They join forces with the Czechoslovak Legion uh, under the slogan, down with the Bolsheviks, down with the Germans. And within weeks, uh, literally, literally within weeks, uh, the, the Czech Legion uh, trains with their uh, armed forces, with their, with their legionnaires, are all over the Siberian tr uh, Railroad as they were en route to Vladivostok to be evacuated to France. Now they rebel against the Bolsheviks, they join hands with the SRs, and within weeks you have a situation where Omsk is in the hands of this government, it's called Committee of the Constituent Assembly, uh, and then Samara, and then uh, very quickly Chelyabinsk. In other words, there's an acute danger that very soon Yekaterinburg would fall to uh, the uh, Czechs and the uh, SRs. Now, it's very important to point, in most of the books, they say that it's the whites who are coming to Yekaterinburg. This is plain wrong. That's not the whites. The entire 1918, the first phase of the Civil War, is the Committee of the Constituent Assembly uh, government, uh, which is formed of the Socialist Revolutionaries primarily, and Mensheviks and some cadets, Constitutional Democrats. Uh, they form an army and, and there are a lot of workers' detachments from Izhevsk and other cities there, so it's not the whites. In any case, as far as the Bolsheviks are concerned, they call them whites because they want to blacken them or discredit them or whatever. They call them monarchists, but in fact they're not. So this is the danger. The danger is that they may seize Yekaterinburg and at this context the decision is made now uh, to execute the Tsar. Now the official story, and I will continue with the official story, uh, but then I will switch to those who have some other ideas and some other historians who doubt the official story. But the story basically was reconstructed uh, remarkably by Professor Pipes of Harvard uh, in his book Russia under the Old Regime, where he basically in, uh, researched and came to a conclusion that it was Lenin himself who made the order to execute the Tsar in early days of July 1918. Uh, now, officially, they proclaimed that it was actually the initiative of the Executive Committee of Soviets of the Urals region. All this, of course, is nonsense. They would not have dared to make such a decision. It was simply uh, to lay the blame at somebody else. Of course, there was no trial. It was really a gang execution that was done. Uh, and that we are quite sure. The Tsar was killed. There's no question about it. The Tsar himself and possibly, most likely, with his son, Alexei, was killed on the night of 16th to 17th of uh, uh, July 1918. And let me read you now the testimony of uh, one uh, Medvedev who participated in the murder and who was actually killed. He disappeared after, like, a year later, he was no more. But this is the, um, this is the testimony that it was done uh, under the commandment of Yurovsky, who was a Cheka man. And this is what Medvedev's testimony is. I'm going to read you uh, exactly as it uh, describes these events. Shortly after one o'clock, the prisoners left their rooms. The Tsar carried the heir, which means Alexei, his son, in his arms. They were both dressed in soldiers' shirts and wore caps. The Empress and her daughters were neither, were neither coats nor hats. The Emperor, carrying his hair, preceded them. The Empress, her daughters, and the other followed him down. Yurovsky, his assistant, and the two Czechists accompanied them. Having descended the stairs, we entered the ground floor of the house. Yurovsky led the way into the room that adjoins the lumber room and ordered chairs to be brought. His assistant brought three, which were given to the Tsar, the Empress, and Alexei. Dr. Botkin stood behind Alexei, the maid, very tall woman, I don't know her name, stood on the left of the door leading to the lumber room. Uh, with her aid, the fourth of the Grand Duchess. The two servants stood in the left lay in the left hand corner facing the entrance near the wall, separating the room from the lumber room. At this moment, eleven men entered the room. Yurovsky, his assistant, the two Czechists, uh, uh, and seven Latvians. Yurovsky ordered 
me. Go to the street, see if there's anybody there, and wait to check where the shots are heard. I went out into the yard, and before I got into the street, I heard firing. I turned back immediately and saw that all the members of the Tsar's family were laying on the floor with many wounds in their bodies. Blood was running in streams. The doctor, maid, and three servants had also been shot. When I entered the air, was still alive and moaning a little. Yurovsky went up to him and fired two or three shots, uh, point blank. Alexei then lay still. So this is a, a classical uh, description, which is uh, confirmed by others. And later on, the key person in the investigation, a year later, it's very important, almost a year later, eight months later, was Mr. Sokolov, who was appointed by the white government of Admiral Kolchak to continue the investigation, which confirmed the death of the Tsar and Alexei, the heir, and uh, his wife and four daughters. This has become the standard um, interpretation, uh, which uh, was confirmed by others, which did not contradict the official Bolshevik version, except that they put the blame on the local Soviet. Uh, and, uh, and it was published only in 1924. There were many other publications. I'm not gonna go into great detail about it. The point is, this is the official interpretation. Now, many, many, many years later, in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet regime, there, there was a great revival of interest as to what happened to the imperial family. And uh, the, the body was ex is exhumed, uh, and there was an analysis of bones made, uh, and it was burned, uh, and so there was only rem remnants of it. And then there was an official inquiry by post-Soviet Russian authorities and by the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, they confirmed officially that the entire family was killed. Uh, including the Tsar and, and the princesses and his wife, uh, Empress Alexandra, etc., etc., and, 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 and then uh, they were all canonized in the year 2000. Now, there were a lot of people at that time who were not sure these are exactly the bodies, uh, but it didn't really matter. It was a kind of a political act to uh, restore um, sort of a, the, the martyrdom of the Tsar, to its rightful place in Russian history and pay the respects and the honor that he deserved. Uh, and uh, as a martyr, uh, he was canonized. The, uh, interestingly enough, in 1999, when I was in uh, Yekaterinburg, the Ipatiev house, this is where the murder took place, was still there. And it was a, a place of great, great uh, pilgrimage. Many people were coming to it and, and paid respects and put all kinds of flowers and things there. Uh, and then uh, under Yeltsin, mysteriously or not, I don't know, but it was destroyed. Uh, and uh, it was a decision made to build a temple on its place that would be um, uh, honoring the Tsar. The, the, the huge big cathedral is there, still is there now. It is very beautiful, dominating uh, the center of uh, Yekaterinburg, and it has become a place of pilgrimage for many who still revere the Tsar. So this is the official story, uh, and I would stop at that, but I'd like to say that in the next video, I would like to uh, discuss some of those who have doubts that that is what happened. Uh, however, uh, the doubts do not concern the Tsar. The Tsar was killed and his son was killed. The doubts are as to what actually happened to the family. And that is the four grand duchesses uh, and his wife, Alexei, and, uh, and his wife, uh, Alexandra. Uh, so we shall discuss it next time. In the meantime, thank you and subscribe to my channel. Bye.